Welcome to Bringing the Word to You. I am your host, Tim Greco, coming to you from Omaha, Nebraska. I know how hard and difficult it is for some of you to get to church and Bible study, so that's where this ministry brings the word to you. You know, God is a good God. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. All thanks to my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the opportunity to teach his word, thanking him for taking me where I once was to where he has brought me to today. Before we get started on this powerful word the Lord has just for you, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We always give you the praise. We always give you the glory. We can't thank you enough. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to lift up your name. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We thank you for the opportunity to read your word, to be doers of your word, and to just be filled with your Holy Spirit, the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven with you. Lord, I pray that the unsaved, the lost, just call upon your name, that they just confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, that they believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for your ongoing love, prayers, support, and contributions to the ministry. Please go visit the website that is on your screen. And we thank you guys for everything. So here, the Lord wanted me to speak today on the plagues that struck Egypt. We all know that Jacob's name was changed to Israel Israel's descendants make up the, the, the country of Israel. We all know that there was a famine in the land. And we all know that Joseph was thrown into a pit. One of Jacob's sons, Joseph, was thrown into a pit. And their brothers conspired to want to kill him. But one of the brothers said, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. And so Joseph was sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites, I believe. And when there was a famine in the land, the Jacob's descendants, Jacob's descendants went to the land of Egypt to get food in the time of famine. And it just so happened that Joseph, the very brother they sold into slavery, was second in command in the land of Egypt and was the very one that the brothers came to get food from. You know, I always think about how David's mistakes on the rooftop when he was lusting after Bathsheba led to her husband being killed on the front lines, led to uh, a baby dying, led to adultery being committed, but also led to the birth of Solomon, the richest, wisest king to ever live. You know, I, I, it reminds me of the, the mistakes uh, that Jacob's children sold Joseph into slavery, ended up leading into a blessing of Joseph being the one to feed the very ones that were in a famine in the land of Israel. I'm sorry that I started over my words right there. It's such a deep, both are such deep, fascinating stories, but I love how mistake turned into blessing. I love how being out there on the streets at the age of 14 and finding out that I was going to be a father Learning that I was going to be a father at the age of 16 led me to salvation. The abandonment, the neglect, and the rejection from my earthly father led me to be adopted by another family and led me to get on my knees and cry out to the Lord and get saved December 24, 2001, when I was 16. His mess ups and his mistakes ended up leaving me empty and hurt to cry out to the Lord to come to salvation. Now I have the greatest father that anybody could ever have. And his name is Father God, as Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Where am I getting at? I'm just kind of summarizing how when Jacob's descendants went to Egypt to get food in the time of famine, they ended up there. And the Egyptians ended up using the Israelites as slaves. The Israelites were held in bondage in the land of Egypt, and the Egyptians worked them for many, many, many years. 
the Egyptians gave these Israelites a quota that was like humanly impossible to even meet. And they were working and they were working and they were working. They started mumbling and, and grumbling. And the Lord called Moses to go free the Israelites out of the land of Egypt to bring them into the promised land. The Lord told Moses to strike the rock for water to come out, so Moses did so. But when the Lord told Moses to get water out of the rock the second time, the second time Moses decided to do things his way again and struck the rock a second time after the Lord told Moses to speak to the rock. So Moses disobeyed the Lord by striking the rock a second time when God told Moses to speak to the rock the second time. Therefore, Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land, but God was merciful and allowed Moses to see the promised land. See, God's a merciful God. God's a graceful God. Where I'm ultimately getting at, well, let me just keep on talking here for a minute. When Moses disobeyed the Lord, God had to use Moses as a public spectacle to say, hey, when you disobey me, this is what happens. Sometimes the Lord will use you as a public spectacle by saying, hey, if you disobey me, this is what's going to happen. Even though the Lord is merciful, even though the Lord is graceful, because what does it look like if you're messing up in front of God's people? And nothing's happening to you. There's no consequences. Other people in the congregation, especially as a leader, they might say, well, hmm, if so-and-so, if, if pastor so-and-so is messing up, then I can mess up. Nothing's happening to him. Nothing's going to happen to me. So while the Lord is merciful, while the Lord is graceful, while the Lord is patient, the Lord also has no problem disciplining his children for he disciplines those that he loves. That's kind of a quick little summary. And I'm sorry I was talking so slow and kind of stuttering. It goes deep. It goes deep. And with no notes or anything right here, it's just the things that I've learned over the years. And all glory to God through the Holy Spirit within me was, was just helped me to kind of summarize that a little bit. So now... We have the Israelites stuck in Egypt and in a land of bondage being used as slaves. And when God called Moses to free the Israelites out of Egypt, we all know the famous, let my people go. So the Israelites were freed from the land of bondage and brought into the promised land, not by Moses, but by Joshua. Now, that's an illustration of fast forward to Jesus freeing us from bondage, living in the land of Egypt and bringing us into the promised land for those who are born again when we die and or when Jesus comes back. So Moses was able to bring the Israelites out of Egypt and Joshua was able to bring them into the promised land. Well, when Jesus comes back, those of us who are born again are going to be brought into the promised land. So get happy and get excited about that. Now, that's a quick summarization of that, which leads me to the plagues here where the plagues strike Egypt. Now, I'm reading this and learning the same time you're learning. We're learning together. I'm not a expert when it comes to this or the plagues. So this is kind of an open television program where we're going to learn together. Here in Exodus 7, down here starting in verse 14, the plagues strike Egypt. The first plague was when water becomes blood. God told Moses that you shall say to them, the Lord of God, Hebrew, sent me to say to you, saying, let my people go, that you may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would rather not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters 
which are in the river with a rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. That's the first plague. See, the general idea is the Egyptians worshipped many gods. The Egyptians worshipped just about every god out there other than the one true god. And so what was the Lord saying sending these plagues in the land of Egypt against the Egyptians was saying, hey, you might serve the water god or the insect god or the fly god or the sun god, but I'm the one true God and I'll show you by overpowering and or defeating all these little gods that you're serving. You know, we can apply that to our everyday life. Every avenue that I've been down in life has always led me back to Jesus. When I served this lowercase g God, the Lord defeated it and took it out of my life. And he says, I'm a jealous God. I want to be number one in your life. When I went down this avenue and started doing these things, the Lord defeated it and took it out of my life and said, I'm the one true God. I'm a jealous God. When I went down this avenue and this avenue and this avenue and this avenue, the Lord shut them all down and showed me and proved to me that he's more powerful, that he's faithful, that he's merciful, that he's graceful. While the Lord could have destroyed me at any moment, he spared my life. And here I am today by the grace of God, sharing the word. The second plague was the plague of frogs. In, Egypt, in, Egypt, in Exodus chapter 8, the plague of frogs. In Exodus chapter 8, in verse 8, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he, may not, that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let my people go. So here Moses and Pharaoh are talking. Pharaoh was always trying to get out of these things, and he was always trying to... To, to, to prevent these plagues from occurring or always trying to sweet talk Moses. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps and the land stank. Can you imagine how stinky the lands were with Heaps and piles and mounds of dead frogs. The third plague was lice. So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land so it may become lice throughout the whole land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand and with a rod and struck the dust of the earth and it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout the land of Egypt. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth the lice. See, Pharaoh and these magicians, they were trying to counterfeit everything that God was doing. Hmm, that sounds pretty familiar. The enemy tries to counterfeit everything God does. We take the rainbow, for example. It is by no accident that in the same chapter, I think is Genesis 9, that God let us know that the rainbow is a promise that he'll never flood the earth again. In the same chapter, God talks about repopulating the earth. What does the enemy do? He encourages man to man and woman to woman with this goofy L, G, B, Q, T, R, I have no idea what the letters even are, group. And then has them use the rainbow that is the Lord's to represent their little clique. Nobody was born gay. That is a temptation from the enemy to keep them from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as a gay Christian. You can't have your cake and eat it too. That's like giving a killer permission to go around and murder everybody and saying he's a Christian. You can't do it. 
Not to get off topic, but that's what the enemy does. He comes in and counterfeits everything. The rainbow belongs to the Lord. It's a symbol that he'll never flood the earth again. You were not born gay. And if you have a penis, you're a male. If you have a vagina, you're a female. Case closed. Let's move forward in life. The second plague is the frogs. The third plague is lice. The fourth plague is a, is, are the flies. The Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out of the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me or else. If you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants. You know, for the sake of time, we could read Exodus 8, Exodus 9, Exodus 10, Exodus 11. So please go ahead and do that in your studies. Exodus chapter 9, the fifth plague. Livestock de deceased. All the Egyptian livestock dies, but none of Israel's is even sick. See, when you belong to the Lord, the enemy can't touch you. He's going to mess with you. He's going to try to confuse you. He's going to try to lie to you. He's going to try to come close to you. But we can't be opening up them doors by choosing sin. We can't be opening up them doors by living in sin. We can be as close to God as we want to. As we draw near to him, he draws near to us. But we got to keep the enemy far away. And what the enemy's doing to his people, he can only try to do to God's people, but it won't succeed. Everything we see in the world today is the enemy. All the negativity and evil we see in the world today is the enemy doing that to his people. It's sad that his people are lost. It's sad that his people are confused. It's sad that his people are empty and have a void. That's where we come in to pray for them, to love on them, and to lead by example. But them being lost and confused and, and these politics promoting all this sick, nasty, disgusting, evil stuff, that's not for us. You're a child of the king. You're a royal priesthood. You've been set apart. Those of us who are saved, we're spending eternity in heaven. God is our father. We're a child of the king. The Lord will always provide for you just like he's always provided for me. We don't have to worry about all these illegal immigrants coming into our country. We don't have to worry about the crime rate increasing. We don't have to worry about what I, where I was getting at with the illegal immigrant thing was the more people and the less food. We don't have to worry about that. Where I was getting at with the illegals coming into our country is it does increase the crime rate. Not every illegal immigrant is a criminal. Don't twist and turn what I'm saying. Because what I'm saying is the more people, the higher the crime rate, the more people and the less food, the more we starve. These are all the more people, the more money our government has to spend, the more money that's taken from us. Oh, these are facts. Don't come at me and twist and turn what I just said. Because if you really heard what I said, you, what I said was truth. There's nothing wrong with illegal people. They're great people. We love them. To summarize again, the more people, the higher the crime rate. The more people, the less food. The more people, the more money we're spending. Right? Right. So... All this stuff is going on in the world today. The wildfires, the weather, all this kind of stuff. We need to stay focused on the prize. We need to stay focused on the goal. We need to continue to run this race and finish this race. The sixth plague are the boils. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves handful of ashes from the furnace and let Moses scatter it towards the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt. Horrible boils broke out on everyone in Egypt. 
we see from plague number one, the blood, to the second, the frogs, the third, the lice, the fourth, the flies, the fifth, the livestock, the sixth, the boils. We see that Pharaoh's magicians were trying to duplicate the miracle by enchantments, and a Pharaoh is unmoved. Again, Pharaoh's magicians try to du duplicate this miracle of sorcery, and Pharaoh is unmoved. We see these magicians are unable to duplicate this. They, they say it is a finger of God, but Pharaoh's heart remains hard. Pharaoh promises to let Hebrews go, but then hardens his heart and refuses with the plague of flies. With the plague of livestock, Pharaoh still refuses to let the people go. With the plague of boils, magicians cannot respond because they are stuck down with boils and, as well, and Pharaoh refuses to listen. We got plague 7 is the hail, plague 8 is the locust, plague 9 is the darkness, plague 10 is the death of the firstborn. These hailstorms kill all the slaves and animals left out or unprotected and strip or destroy almost every plant. These locusts cover Egypt and eat everything left after the hail. Total darkness covers Egypt for three days, so no one can even move except the Hebrew who have light as usual. God's people were always taken care of. Just like today, God's people are always taken care of. When you keep your eyes on God, the Bible says don't worry about anything, pray about everything. You know, that illegal immigrant little conversation a minute ago for a minute, it's sitting with me. It's kind of bothering me a little bit. Some of my best friends are illegals. I love them. Not all illegal immigrants are bad people, just like not all Americans are bad people, just like all African Americans are not bad people, just like all Asians are not bad people. You can't stereotype because one illegal immigrant does one bad thing. You can't say all illegal immigrants are bad. When one white person does a bad thing, you can't say all white people are bad. Every ethnicity has a bad person, a good person, a strong person, a weak person. I mean, every, we're humans. Black people have smart, intelligent criminals, scientists, doctors, lawyers. White people have smart, intelligent people, criminals, doctors, lawyers. Asians have criminals, smart, intelligent people, doctors, lawyers. Latinos have smart, intelligent, it's called being a human. And ain't no ethnicity better than the next. So what I'm saying is when one ethnicity does something, when one, when one person does something, when one white person does something bad, we think all white people are bad. That's not true. I don't want to get political. There's rules and regulations to become a citizen somewhere. I'm going on a rabbit trail that I don't, that's not even where I'm getting at. I want to cover up what was said about there's nothing wrong with the person who's an illegal immigrant. What I'm saying is the enemy is doing all these things in our country and around the world. More people, less food. More people, more crimes, more people, more confusion. More. That's not for us. Black, white, Asian, Latino, God loves everybody the same. He's no respecter of persons. And I love you the same. We got to turn to God. We got to turn to the Lord. Because these plagues of blood... These plagues of frogs, these plagues of lice and flies and livestock and boils and hail and locusts and darkness and, and the death of the firstborn and, and so on. God is showing himself to be greater. God is greater than anything you're going through. 
God is greater than any lowercase g God that you might be serving. If you're putting sports in front of God, God's going to show you that He's greater than what He created as opposed to you thinking the created is bigger than the Creator. If you're putting drugs or alcohol or gambling or whatever in front of God, He's going to show you that He's greater. And that's exactly what He was doing here in the book of Exodus. He was showing Pharaoh that these lowercase g gods ain't nothing on God Almighty. And even though Pharaoh hardened his heart, are you hardening your heart today? Because whether you're white, black, brown, yellow, orange, green, purple, or violet, God loves you. And you're valuable. And you're important. Whether you're legal or Ill illegal, you call upon the name of the Lord because He wants to save you today. You could be adopted into the body of Christ. If anybody ever needs anything, doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, we're human beings. You reach out to me anytime because I love you. You're not going to be able to overcome the things in your life by yourself. But when you call upon the name of the Lord and receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is going to give you the power and the strength to overcome anything. You reach out to me anytime for anything because you always have a friend in me. And if nobody told you they love you today, I love you. God loves you. I pray you have a blessed rest of the day. In Jesus' name, let's go.